Preface This work is the outgrowth of an effort on the part of the editors of McClure's magazine to deal concretely in their pages with the trust question. In order that their readers might have a clear and succinct notion of the processes by which a particular industry passes from the control of the many to that of the few, they decided a few years ago to publish a detailed narrative of the history of the growth of a particular trust. The Standard Oil Trust was chosen for obvious reasons. It was the first in the field, and it has furnished the methods, the charter, and the traditions for its followers. It is the most perfectly developed trust in existence, that is, it satisfies most nearly the trust ideal of entire control of the commodity in which it deals. Its vast profits have led its officers into various allied interests, such as railroads, shipping, gas, copper, iron, steel, as well as into banks and trust companies, and to the acquiring and solidifying of these interests it has applied the methods used in building up the oil trust. It has led in the struggle against legislation directed against combinations, its power in state and federal government, in the press, in the college, in the pulpit, is generally recognized. The perfection of the organization of the standard the ability and daring with which it has carried out its projects make it the preeminent trust of the world, the one whose story is best fitted to illuminate the subject of combinations of capital. Another important consideration with the editors in deciding that the Standard Oil Trust was the best adapted to illustrate their meaning was the fact that it is one of the very few business organizations of the country whose growth could be traced in trustworthy documents. There is in existence just such documentary material for a history of the Standard Oil Company as there is for a history of the Civil War, or the French Revolution, or any other national episode which has divided men's minds. This has come about largely from the fact that almost constantly since its organization in 1870, the Standard Oil Company has been under investigation by the Congress of the United States and by the legislatures of various states in which it has operated, on the suspicion that it was receiving rebates from the railroads, and was practicing methods in restraint of free trade. In 1872, and again in 1876, it was before congressional committees. In 1879, it was before examiners of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and before committees appointed by the legislatures of New York and of Ohio for investigating railroads. Its operations figured constantly in the debate which led up to the creation of the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1887, and again and again since that time the Commission has been called upon to examine directly or indirectly into its relation with the railroads. In 1888, in the investigation of trust conducted by Congress and by the State of New York, the Standard Oil Company was the chief subject for examination. In the state of Ohio between 1882 and 1892, a constant warfare was waged against the Standard in the courts and legislature, resulting in several volumes of testimony. The legislatures of many other states concerned themselves with it. This hostile legislation compelled the trust to separate into its component parts in 1892, but investigation did not cease. Indeed, in the last great industrial inquiry, conducted by the commission appointed by President McKinley, the Standard Oil Company was constantly under discussion, and hundreds of pages of testimony on it appear in the nineteen volumes of reports which the commission has submitted. This mass of testimony, all of it submitted under oath it should be remembered, contains the different charters and agreements under which the Standard Oil Trust has operated, many contracts and agreements with railroads, with refineries, with pipelines, and it contains the experiences in business from 1872 up to 1900 of multitudes of individuals. These experiences have exactly the quality of the personal reminiscences of actors in great events, with the additional value that they were given on the witness stand, and it is fair, therefore, to suppose that they are more cautious and exact in statements than many writers of memoirs are. These investigations covering as they do all of the important steps in the development of the trust, include full accounts of the point of view of its officers in regard to that development, 
as well as their explanations of many of the operations over which controversy has arisen. Hundreds of pages of sworn testimony are found in these volumes from John D. Rockefeller, William Rockefeller, Henry M. Flagler, H. H. Rogers, John D. Archbald, Daniel O'Day, and other members of the concern. Aside from the great mass of sworn testimony accessible to the student, there is a large pamphlet literature dealing with different phases of the subject, and there are files of the numerous daily newspapers and monthly reviews, supported by the oil regions, in the columns of which are to be found not only statistics, but full reports of all controversies between oil men. No complete collection of this voluminous printed material has ever been made, but several small collections exist, and in one or another of these I have been able to find practically all of the important documents relating to the subject. Mrs. Roger Sherman of Titusville, Pennsylvania, owns the largest of these collections, and in it are to be found copies of the rarest pamphlets. Louis Emery, Jr. of Bradford, the late E. G. Patterson of Titusville, the late Henry D. Lloyd, author of Wealth vs. Commonwealth, William Hassan of Oil City, and P. C. Boyle, the editor of the Oil City Derrick, have collections of value, and they have all been most generous in giving me access to their books. But the documentary sources of this work are by no means all printed. The Standard Oil Trust and its constituent companies have figured in many civil suits, the testimony of which is still in manuscript in the files of the courts where the suits were tried. These manuscripts have been examined on the ground and in numerous instances full copies of affidavits and of important testimony have been made for permanent reference and study. I have also had access to many files of private correspondence and papers, the most important being that of the officers and counsel of the Petroleum Producers Union from 1878 to 1880, that covering the organization from 1887 to 1895, of the various independent companies which resulted in the Pure Oil Company, and that containing the material prepared by Roger Sherman for the suit brought in 1897 by the United States Pipeline against certain of the standard companies under the Sherman Antitrust Act. As many of the persons who have been active in the development of the oil industry are still living, their help has been freely sought. Scores of persons in each of the great oil centers have been interviewed, and the comprehension and interpretation of the documents on which the work is based have been materially aided by the explanations which the actors in the events under consideration were able to give. When the work was first announced in the fall of 1901, the Standard Oil Company, or perhaps I should say officers of the company, courteously offered to give me all the assistance in their power, an offer of which I have freely taken advantage. In accepting assistance from Standard men as from independents, I distinctly stated that I wanted facts, and that I reserved the right to use them according to my own judgment of their meaning that my object was to learn more perfectly what was actually done, not to learn what my informants thought of what had been done. It is perhaps not too much to say that there is not a single important episode in the history of the Standard Oil Company, so far as I know it, or a notable step in its growth which I have not discussed more or less fully with officers of the company. It is needless to add that the conclusions expressed in this work are my own. I am T. End of Preface Chapter 1 Part 1 The Birth of an Industry One of the busiest corners of the globe at the opening of the year 1872 was a strip of northwestern Pennsylvania, not over fifty miles long, known the world over as the oil regions. Twelve years before, this strip of land had been but little better than a wilderness. Its chief inhabitants, the lumbermen, who every season cut great swaths of primeval pine and hemlock from its hills, and in the spring floated them down the Allegheny River to Pittsburgh. The great tides of western emigration had shunned the spot for years as too rugged and unfriendly for settlement, and yet in twelve years this region avoided by men had been transformed into a bustling trade center, where towns elbowed each other for place, into which three great trunk railroads had built branches, and every foot of whose soil was fought for by capitalists. 
it was the discovery and development of a new raw product, petroleum, which had made this change from wilderness to marketplace. This product in twelve years had not only peopled a waste place of the earth, it had revolutionized the world's methods of illumination, and added millions upon millions of dollars to the wealth of the United States. Petroleum, as a curiosity, and indeed in a small way as an article of commerce, was no new thing when its discovery in quantities called the attention of the world to this corner of northwestern Pennsylvania. The journals of many an early explorer of the valleys of the Allegheny and its tributaries tell of springs and streams, the surfaces of which were found covered with a thick oily substance which burned fiercely when ignited, and which the Indians believed to have curative properties. As the country was opened, more and more was heard of these oil springs. Certain streams came to be named from the quantities of the substance found on the surface of the water, as Oil Creek in northwestern Pennsylvania, Old Greasy or Kanawha in West Virginia. The belief in the substance as a cure-all increased as time went on, and in various parts of the country it was regularly skimmed from the surface of the water as cream from a pan, or soaked up by woolen blankets bottled and peddled as a medicine for man and beast. Up to the beginning of the nineteenth century no oil seems to have been obtained except from the surfaces of springs and streams. That it was to be found far below the surface of the earth was discovered independently at various points in Kentucky, West Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania by persons drilling for salt water to be used in manufacturing salt. Not infrequently the water they found was mixed with a dark green, evil-smelling substance which was recognized as identical with the well-known rock oil. It was necessary to rid the water of this before it could be used for salt, and in many places cisterns were devised in which the brine was allowed to stand until the oil had risen to the surface. It was then run into the streams or on the ground. This practice was soon discovered to be dangerous, so easily did the oil ignite. In several places, particularly in Kentucky, so much oil was obtained with the salt water that the wells had to be abandoned. Certain of these deserted salt wells were opened years after, when it was found that the troublesome substance which had made them useless was far more valuable than the brine the original drillers sought. Naturally, the first use made of the oil obtained in quantities from the salt wells was medicinal. By the middle of the century it was without doubt the great American medicine. Seneca oil seems to have been the earliest name under which petroleum appeared in the East. It was followed by a large output of Kentucky petroleum sold under the name American Medicinal Oil. Several hundred thousand bottles of this oil are said to have been put up in Burkesville, Kentucky and to have been shipped to the East and to Europe. The point at which the business of bottling petroleum for medicine was carried on most systematically and extensively was Pittsburgh. Near that town, at Tarantum in Allegheny County, were located salt wells owned and operated in the forties by Samuel M. Keir. The oil which came up with the salt water was sufficient to be a nuisance, and Mr. Keir sought a way to use it. Believing it had curative qualities, he began to bottle it. By 1850 he had worked up this business until Kier's petroleum, or rock oil, was sold all over the United States. The crude petroleum was put up in eight-ounce bottles, wrapped in a circular setting forth in good patent medicine style its virtues as a cure-all and giving directions about its use. While it was admitted to be chiefly a liniment, it was recommended for cholera morbus, liver complaint, bronchitis and consumption, and the dose prescribed was three teaspoonfuls three times a day. Mr. Keir's circulars are crowded with testimonials of the efficacy of rock oil, dated anywhere between 1848 and 1853. Although his trade in this oil was so extensive, he was not satisfied that petroleum was useful only as a medicine. He was interested in it as a lubricator and a luminant, that petroleum had the qualities of both had been discovered at more than one point before 1850. More than one mill owner in the districts where petroleum had been found was using it in a crude way for oiling his machines or lighting his works. 
but though the qualities of both lubricator and luminant were present, the impurities of the natural oil were too great to make its use general. Mr. Keir seems to have been the first man to have attempted to secure an expert opinion as to the possibility of refining it. In 1849 he sent a bottle of oil to a chemist in Philadelphia, who advised him to try distilling it and burning it in a lamp. Mr. Keir followed the advice, and a five-barrel still which he used in the fifties for refining petroleum is still to be seen in Pittsburgh. His trade in the oil he produced at his little refinery was not entirely local, for in 1858 we find him agreeing to sell to Joseph Coffin of New York at sixty-two and a half cents a gallon one hundred barrels of carbon oil that will burn in the ordinary coal oil lamp. Although Mr. Keir seems to have done a good business in rock oil, neither he nor anyone else up to this point had thought it worth while to seek petroleum for its own sake. They had all simply sought to utilize what rose before their eyes on springs and streams, or came to them mixed with the salt water for which they drilled. In 1854, however, a man was found who took rock oil more seriously. This man was George H. Bissell, a graduate of Dartmouth College who, worn out by an experience of ten years in the South as a journalist and teacher, had come north for a change. At his old college the latest curiosity of the laboratory was shown him, the bottle of rock oil, and the professor contended that it was as good or better than coal for making illuminating oil. Bissell inquired into its origin, and was told that it came from oil springs located in northwestern Pennsylvania on the farm of a lumber firm, Brewer, Watson & Company. These springs had long yielded a supply of oil which was regularly collected and sold for medicine, and was used locally by mill owners for lighting and lubricating purposes. Bissell seems to have been impressed with the commercial possibilities of the oil, for he at once organized a company, the Pennsylvania Rock Oil Company, the first in the United States, and leased the lands on which these oil springs were located. He then sent a quantity of the oil to Professor Sullivan of Yale College and paid him for analyzing it. The professor's report was published and received general attention. From the rock oil might be made as good an illuminant as any the world knew. It also yielded gas, paraffin, lubricating oil. In short, declared Professor Silliman, your company have in their possession a raw material from which, by simple and not expensive process, they may manufacture very valuable products. It is worthy of note that my experiments prove that nearly the whole of the raw product may be manufactured without waste, and this solely by a well-directed process which is in practice in one of the most simple of all chemical processes. The oil was valuable, but could it be obtained in quantity great enough to make the development of so remote a locality worthwhile? The only method of obtaining it known to Mr. Bissell and his associates in the new company was from the surface of oil springs. Could it be obtained in any other way? There has long been a story current in the oil regions that the Pennsylvania Rock Oil Company received its first notion of drilling for oil from one of those trivial incidents which so often turn the course of human affairs. As the story goes, Mr. Bissell was one day walking down Broadway when he halted to rest in the shade of an awning before a drug store. In the window he saw on a bottle a curious label. Here's petroleum, or rock oil, it read. Celebrated for its wonderful curative powers, a natural remedy, produced from a well in Allegheny County, P.A., four hundred feet below the earth's surface, etc. On the label was the picture of an artesian well. It was from this well that Mr. Keir got his natural remedy. Hundreds of men had seen the label before, for it went out on every one of Mr. Keir's circulars, but this was the first to look at it with a seeing eye. As quickly as the bottle of rock oil in the Dartmouth laboratory had awakened in Mr. Bissell's mind the determination to find out the real value of the strange substance, the label gave him the solution of the problem of getting oil in quantities. It was to bore down into the earth where it was stored and pump it up. Professor Silliman made his report to the Pennsylvania Rock Oil Company in 1855. 
but it was not until the spring of 1858 that a representative of the organization, which by this time had changed hands and was known as the Seneca Oil Company, was on the ground with orders to find oil. The man sent out was a small stockholder in the company, Edwin L. Drake, Colonel Drake, as he was called. Drake had had no experience to fit him for his task. A man forty years of age, he had spent his life as a clerk, an express agent, and a railway conductor. His only qualifications were a dash of pioneer blood and a great persistency in undertakings which interested him. Whether Drake came to Titusville ordered to put down an artesian well or not is a mooted point. His latter-day admirers claim that the idea was entirely his own. It seems hardly credible that men as intelligent as Professor Silliman, Mr. Bissell, and others interested in the Pennsylvania Rock Oil Company should not have taken means of finding out how the familiar Kears Rock Oil was obtained. Professor Silliman at least must have known of the quantities of oil which had been obtained in different states in drilling salt wells. Indeed, in his report, he speaks of wells sunk for the purpose of accumulating the product in the American Journal of Science for 1840, of which he was one of the editors, is an account of a famous oil well struck near Burtsville, Kentucky, about 1830 when drilling for salt. It seems probable that the idea of seeking oil on the lands leased by the Petroleum Rock Oil Company by drilling artesian wells had long been discussed by the gentlemen interested in the venture, and that Drake came to Titusville with instructions to put down a well. It is certain, at all events, that he was soon explaining to his superiors at home the difficulty of getting a driller, an engine-house and tools, and that he was employing the interval in trying to open new oil springs and make the old ones more profitable. The task before Drake was no light one. The spot to which he had been sent was Titusville, a lumberman's hamlet on Oil Creek, fourteen miles from where that stream joins the Allegheny River. Its chief connection with the outside world was by a stage to Erie, forty miles away. This remoteness from civilization, and Drake's own ignorance of artesian wells, added to the general skepticism of the community concerning the enterprise, caused great difficulty and long delays. It was months before Drake succeeded in getting together the tools, engine and rigging necessary to bore his well, and before he could get a driller who knew how to manipulate them, Winter had come, and he had to suspend operations. People called him crazy for sticking to the enterprise, but that had no effect on him. As soon as spring opened, he borrowed a horse and wagon and drove over a hundred miles to Tarantum, where Mr. Keir was still pumping his salt wells and was either bottling or refining the oil which came up with the brine. Here Drake hoped to find a driller. He brought back a man, and after a few months more of experiments and accidents, the drill was started. One day, late in August, 1859, Titusville was electrified by the news that Drake's folly, as many of the onlookers had come to consider it, had justified itself. The well was full of oil. The next day a pump was started, and twenty-five barrels of oil were gathered. There was no doubt of the meaning of the Drake well in the minds of the people of the vicinity. They had long ago accepted all Professor Silliman had said of the possibilities of petroleum, and now that they knew how it could be obtained in quantity, the whole countryside rushed out to obtain leases. The second well in the immediate region was drilled by a Titusville tanner, William Barnsdall, an Englishman who at his majority had come to America to make his fortune. He had fought his way westward, watching always for his chance. The day the Drake well was struck, he knew it had come. Quickly forming a company, he began to drill a well. He did not wait for an engine, but worked his drill through the rock by a spring pole. It took three months and cost three thousand dollars to do it, but he had his reward. On February 1, 1860, he struck oil, twenty-five barrels a day and oil was selling at eighteen dollars a barrel. In five months the English tanner had sold over sixteen thousand dollars worth of oil. A lumberman and merchant of the village, who long had faith in petroleum if it could be had in quantity, 
Jonathan Watson, one of the firm of Brewer, Watson & Company, whose land the Pennsylvania Rock Oil Company had leased, mounted his horse as soon as he heard of the Drake well, and riding down the valley of Oil Creek, spent the day in leasing farms. He soon had the third well of the region going down, this too by a spring pole. This well started off in March at sixty gallons a minute, and oil was selling at sixty cents a gallon. In two years the farm where this third well was struck had produced a hundred and sixty-five thousand barrels of oil. Working an unfriendly piece of land a few miles below the Drake well lived a man of thirty-five. Setting out for himself at twenty-two, he had won his farm by the most dogged efforts, working at sawmills, saving his earnings, buying a team, working it for others until he could take up a piece of land, hoarding his savings here. For what? How could he know? He knew well enough when Drake struck oil, and hastened out to buy a share in a two-acre farm. He sold it at a profit, and with the money put down a well, from which he realized seventy thousand dollars. A few years later the farm he had slaved to win came into the field. In 1871 he refused a million dollars for it, and at one time he had stored there two hundred thousand barrels of oil. A young doctor who had buried himself in the wilderness saw his chance. For a song he bought thirty-eight acres on the creek, six miles below the Drake well, and sold half of it for the price he had paid to a country storekeeper and lumberman of the vicinity, one Charles Hyde. Out of this thirty-eight acres millions of dollars came. One well alone, the maple shade, cleared one and one-half millions. On every rocky farm, in every poor settlement of the region, was some man whose ear was attuned to fortune's call, and who had the daring and the energy to risk everything he possessed in an oil lease. It was well that he acted at once, for as the news of the discovery of oil reached the open, the farms and towns of Ohio, New York, and Pennsylvania poured out a stream of ambitious and vigorous youth, eager to seize what might be there for them, while from the East came men with money and business experience, who formed great stock companies, took up the lands in parcels of thousands of acres, and put down wells along every rocky run and creek as well as over the steep hills. In answer to their drill, oil poured forth in floods. In many places pumping was out of the question. The wells flowed two thousand, three thousand, four thousand barrels a day, such quantities of it that at the close of 1861 oil, which in January of 1860 was $20 a barrel, had fallen to ten cents. Here was the oil and in unheard of quantities, and with it came all the swarm of problems which a discovery brings. The methods Drake had used were crude and must be improved. The processes of refining were those of the laboratory and must be developed. Communication with the outside world must be secured. Markets must be built up. Indeed, a whole new commercial machine had to be created to meet the discovery. These problems were not realized before the region teemed with men to wrestle with them, men alive to the instant need of things. They had to begin with so simple and elementary a matter as devising something to hold the oil. There were not barrels enough to be bought in America, although turpentine barrels, molasses barrels, whiskey barrels, every sort of barrel and cask, were added to new ones made especially for oil. Reservoirs excavated in the earth and faced with logs and cement, and box-like structures of planks or logs were tried at first, but were not satisfactory. A young Iowa schoolteacher and farmer, visiting at his home in Erie County, went to the region. Immediately he saw his chance. It was to invent a receptacle which would hold oil in quantities. Certain large producers listened to his scheme and furnished money to make a trial tank. It was a success, and before many months the schoolteacher was buying thousands of feet of lumber, employing scores of men, and working them and himself day and night. For nearly ten years he built these wooden tanks. Then seeing that iron tanks, huge receptacles holding thousands of barrels of oil where his held hundreds, were bound to supersede him, 
he turned, with the ready adaptability which characterized the men of the region, to producing oil for others to tank. After the storing problem came that of transportation. There was one waterway leading out. Oil Creek, as it had been called for more than a hundred years, an uncertain stream running the length of the narrow valley in which the oil was found and uniting with the Allegheny River at what is now known as Oil City. From this junction it was 132 miles to Pittsburgh and a railroad. Besides this waterway were rough country roads leading to the railroads at Union City, Corey, Erie, and Meadville. There was but one way to get the oil to the bank of Oil Creek or to the railroads, and that was by putting it into barrels and hauling it. Teamsters equipped for their service seemed to fall from the sky. The farms for a hundred miles around gave up their boys and horses and wagons to supply the need. It paid. There were times when three or even four dollars a barrel were paid for hauling five or ten miles. It was not too much for the work. The best roads over which they traveled were narrow, rough, unmade highways, mere openings to the outer world, while the roads to the wells they themselves had to break across fields and through forests. These roads were made almost impassable by the great number of heavily freighted wagons traveling over them. From the big wells a constant procession of teams ran, and it was no uncommon thing for a visitor to the oil regions to meet oil caravans of a hundred or more wagons. Often these caravans were held up for hours by a dangerous mud hole into which a wheel had sunk or a horse fallen. If there was a possible way to be made around the obstruction, it was taken, even if it led through a farmer's field. Indeed, a sort of guerrilla warfare went on constantly between the farmers and the teamsters. Often the roads became impassable, so that new ones had to be broken, and not even a shotgun could keep the driver from going where the passage was least difficult. The teamster, in fact, carried a weapon which few farmers cared to face, his terrible black snake, as his long, heavy black whip was called. The man who had once felt the cruel lash of a black snake around his legs did not often oppose the owner. With the wages paid him the teamster could easily become a kind of plutocrat. One old producer tells of having a teamster in his employ, who for nine weeks drew only enough of his earnings to feed himself and horses. He slept in his wagons and tethered the team. At the end of the time he thought he'd go home for a clean shirt and asked for a settlement. It was found that he had nineteen hundred dollars to his credit. The story is a fair illustration both of the habits and the earnings of the Oil Creek Teamsters. Indispensable to the business, they became the tyrants of the region. Working and brawling as suited them, a genius not unlike the flatboat men who once gave color to life on the Mississippi, or the cowboys who make the plains picturesque today. Bad as their reputation was, many a man found in their ranks the start which led later to wealth and influence in the oil business. One of the shrewdest, kindest, oddest men the oil regions ever knew, Wesley Chambers, came to the top from the teamster class. He had found his way to the creek after eight years of unsuccessful gold hunting in California. There's my chance, he said, when he saw the lack of teams and boats and he set about organizing a service for transporting oil to Pittsburgh. In a short time he was buying horses of his own and building boats. Wide awake to actualities, he saw a few years later that the teamster and the boat were to be replaced by the pipeline and the railroad, and forestalled the change by becoming a producer. In this problem of transportation the most important element after the team was Oil Creek and the flatboat. A more uncertain stream never ran in a bed. In the summer it was low, in the winter frozen. Now it was gorged with ice, now running mad over the flats. The best service was gotten out of it in time of low water through artificial freshets. Mill dams, controlled by private parties, were frequent along the creek and its tributaries. By arrangement these dams were cut on a certain day or days of the week, usually Friday, and on the flood or freshet the flatboats loaded with barrels of oil were floated downstream. The freshet was always exciting and perilous 
and frequently disastrous. From the points where they were tied up the boatmen watched the coming flood and cut themselves loose the moment after its head had passed them. As one fleet after another swung into the roaring flood the danger of collision and jams increased. Rare indeed was the freshet when a few wrecks did not lie somewhere along the creek, and often scores lay piled high on the bank, a hopeless jam of broken boats and barrels, the whole soaked in petroleum and reeking with gas and profanity. If the boats rowed safely through to the river there was little further danger. The Allegheny River traffic grew to great proportions. Fully one thousand boats and some thirty steamers were in the fleet, and at least four thousand men. This traffic was developed by men who saw here their opportunity of fortune, as others had seen it in drilling or teaming. The foremost of these men was an Ohio River captain, driven northward by the war, one J. J. Vandergrift. Captain Vandergrift had run the full gamut of river experiences, from cabin boy to owner and commander of his own steamers. The war stopped his Mississippi River trade. Fitting up one of his steamers as a gunboat, he turned it over to Commodore Foote and looked for a new stream to navigate. From the oil region at that moment the loudest cry was for barrels. He towed four thousand empty casks up the river, saw at once the need of some kind of bulk transportation, took his hint from a bulk boat which an ingenious experimenter was trying, ordered a dozen of them built, towed his fleet to the creek, bought oil to fill them, and then returned to Pittsburgh to sell his cargo. On one alone he made seventy thousand dollars. But the railroad soon pressed the river hard. At the time of the discovery of oil, three lines, the Philadelphia and Erie, the Buffalo and Erie, now the Lake Shore, connecting with the Central, and the Atlantic and Great Western connecting with the Erie, were within teeming distance of the region. The points at which the Philadelphia and Erie Road could be reached were Erie, forty miles from Titusville, Union City, twenty-two miles, and Corey, sixteen miles. The Buffalo and Erie were reached at Erie, the Atlantic and Great Western were reached at Meadville, Union City, and Corey, and the distances were twenty-eight, twenty-two, and sixteen miles respectively. Erie was the favorite shipping point at first, as the wagon road in that direction was the best. The amount of freight the railroads carried the first year of the business was enormous. Of course, connecting lines were built as rapidly as men could work. By the beginning of 1863 the Oil Creek Road, as it was known, had reached Titusville from Corey. This gave an eastern connection by both the Philadelphia and Erie and the Atlantic and Great Western but as the latter were constructing a branch from Meadville to Franklin, the Oil Creek Road became the feeder of the former principally. Both of these roads were completed to Oil City by 1865. The railroads built, the vexatious time-taking and costly problem of getting the oil from the well to the shipping point still remained. The teamster was still the tyrant of the business. His day was almost over. He was to fall before the pipeline. The feasibility of carrying oil in pipes was discussed almost from the beginning of the oil business. Very soon after the Drake well was struck, oil man began to say that the natural way to get this oil from the wells to the railroads was through pipes. In many places gravity would carry it. Where it could not, pumps would force it. The belief that this could be done was so strong that as early as February 1862, a company was incorporated in Pennsylvania for carrying oil in pipes or tubes from any point on Oil Creek to its mouth or to any station on the Philadelphia and Erie Railroad. This company seems never to have done more than get a charter. In 1863 at least three short pipelines were put into operation. The first of these was a two-inch pipe through which distillate was pumped a distance of three miles from the Warren refinery at Plumer to Warren's Landing on the Allegheny River. The one which attracted the most attention was a line two and one-half miles in length carrying crude oil from the Tar Farm to the Humboldt refinery at Plumer. Various other experiments were made, both gravity and pumps being trusted for propelling the oil, but there was always something wrong. The pipes leaked or burst, the pumps were too weak. Shifting oil centers interrupted experiments which might have been successful. 
Then suddenly the man for the need appeared, Samuel Van Sickle. He came to the creek in 1864 with some money, hoping to make more. He handled quantities of oil produced at Pithole, several miles from a shipping point, and saw his profits eaten up by teamsters. Their tyranny aroused his ire and his wits, and he determined to build a pipeline from the wells to the railroad. He was greeted with jeers, but he went doggedly ahead, laid a two-inch pipe, put in three relay pumps, and turned in his oil. From the start the line was a success, carrying eighty barrels of oil an hour. The day that the Van Sickle pipeline began to run oil, a revolution began in the business. After the Drake well it is the most important event in the history of the oil regions. The Teamsters saw its meaning first and turned out in fury, dragging the pipe which was for the most part buried to the surface, and cutting it so that the oil would be lost. It was only by stationing an armed guard that they were held in check. A second line of importance, that of Abbott and Harley, suffered even more than that of Van Sickle. The Teamsters did more than cut the pipe. They burned the tanks in which oil was stored, laid in wait for employees, threatened with destruction the wells which furnished the oil, and so generally terrorized the country that the governor of the state was called upon in April 1866 to protect the property and men of the lines. The day of the Teamster was over, however, and the more philosophical of them accepted the situation. Scores disappeared from the region, and scores more took to drilling. They died hard, and the cutting and plugging of pipelines was for years a pastime of the remnant of their race. End of Part 1, Chapter 1, Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. The History of Standard Oil by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter 1, Part 2. If the uses to which oil might be put, and the methods for manufacturing it had not been well understood when the Drake well was struck, there would have been no such imperious demand as came for the immediate opening of new territory and developing methods of handling and carrying it on a large scale. But men already knew what the oil was good for, and in a crude way how to distill it. The process of distillation also was free to all. The essential apparatus was very simple, a cast-iron still, usually surrounded by brickwork, a copper worm, and two tin or zinc lined tanks. The still was filled with crude oil, which was subjected to a high enough heat to vaporize it. The vapor passed through a cast iron gooseneck fitted to the top of the still into the copper worm, which was immersed in water. Here the vapor was condensed and passed into the zinc lined tank. This product, called a distillate, was treated with chemicals washed with water and run off into the tin lined tank where it was allowed to settle. Anybody who could get the apparatus could make oil, and many men did, badly of course to begin with, and with an alarming proportion of waste and explosion and fires, but with experience they learned, and some of the great refineries of the country grew out of these rude beginnings. Luckily not all the men who undertook the manufacturing of petroleum in these first days were inexperienced. The chemists to whom are due chiefly the processes now used, Atwood, Gessner, and Merrill, had for many years been busy making oils from coal. They knew something of petroleum, and when it came in quantities began at once to adapt their processes to it. Merrill at the time was connected with Samuel Downer of Boston in manufacturing oil from Trinidad pitch and from coal bought in Newfoundland. The year oil was discovered, Mr. Downer distilled 7,500 tons of this coal clearing on it at least one hundred thousand dollars. As soon as petroleum appeared, he and Mr. Merrill saw that here was a product which was bound to displace their coal, and with courage and promptness they prepared to adapt their works. In order to be near the supply they came to Corey, fourteen miles from the Drake Well, and in 1862 put up a refinery which cost two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Here were refined thousands of barrels of oil, most of which was sent to New York for export. 
To the Boston works the firm went crude, which was manufactured for the home trade and for shipping to California and Australia. The processes used in the downer works at this early day were in all essentials the same as are used today. In 1865 William Wright, after a careful study of petroleum, as the oil regions were then often called, published with Harper and Brothers an interesting volume in which he devotes a chapter to oil refining and refiners. Mr. Wright describes there not only the downer works at Corey, but a factory which, if much less important in the development of the oil regions, held a much larger place in its imagination. This was the Humboldt works at Plumer. In 1862 two German brothers, the Messrs. Ludovici, came to the oil country and, choosing a spot distant from oil wells, main roads, or water courses, erected an oil refinery which was reported to have cost a half million dollars. The works were built in a way unheard of then and uncommon now. The foundations were all of cut stone. The boiler and engines were of the most expensive character. A house erected in connection with the refinery was said to have been finished in hardwood with marble mantels and furnished with rich carpets, mirrors, and elaborate furniture. The lavishness of the Humboldt refinery and the formality with which its business was conducted were long a tradition in the oil regions. Of more practical moment are the features of the refinery which Mr. Wright mentions. One is that the works had been so planned as to take advantage of the natural descent of the ground, so that the oil would pass from one set of vessels to another without using artificial power, and the other that the supply of crude oil was obtained from the tar farm three miles away, being forced by pumps through pipes over the hills. Mr. Wright found some twenty refineries between Titusville and Oil City the year of his visit, 1865. In several factories that he visited they were making naphtha, gasoline, and benzene for export. Three grades of illuminating oils, prime white, standard white, and straw color, were made everywhere. Paraffin, refined to a pure white article like that of today, was manufactured in quantities by the downer works and lubricating oils were beginning to be made. As men and means were found to put down wells, to devise and build tanks and boats and pipes and railroads for handling the oil, to adapt and improve process for manufacturing, so men were found from the beginning of the oil business to wrestle with every problem raised. They came in shoals, young, vigorous, resourceful, indifferent to difficulties, greedy for a chance, and with each year they forced more light and wealth from the new product. By the opening of 1872 they had produced nearly forty million barrels of oil and had raised their product to the fourth place among the exports of the United States, over 152 million gallons going abroad in 1871, a percentage of the production which compares well with what goes today. As for the market, they had developed it until it included almost every country of the earth. China, the East and West Indies, South America, and Africa. Over forty different European ports received refined oil from the United States in 1871. Nearly a million gallons were sent to Syria, about a half million to Egypt, about as much to the British West Indies, and a quarter of a million to the Dutch East Indies. Not only were illuminating oils being exported. In 1871, Nearly seven million gallons of naphtha, benzene, and gasoline were sent abroad, and it became evident now for the first time that a valuable trade in lubricants made from petroleum was possible. A discovery by Joshua Merrill of the Downer Works opened this new source of wealth to the industry. Until 1869 the impossibility of deodorizing petroleum had prevented its use largely as a lubricant but in that year Mr. Merrill discovered a process by which a deodorized lubricating oil could be made. He had both the apparatus for producing the oil and the oil itself patented. The oil was so favorably received that the market sale by the Downer Works was several hundred percent greater in a single year than the firm had ever sold before. The oil field had been extended from the valley of Oil Creek and its tributaries down the Allegheny River for fifty miles and probably covered two thousand square miles. The early theory that oil followed the streams had been exploded, and wells were now drilled on the hills. 
It was known, too, that if oil was found in the first sand struck in the drilling, it might be found still lower in a second or third sand. The Drake well had struck oil at sixty-nine and a half feet, but wells were now drilled as deep as sixteen hundred feet. The extension of the field, the discovery that oil was under the hills as well as under streams, and to be found in various sands, had cost enormously. It had been done by wildcatting, as putting down experimental wells were called, by following superstitions in locating wells, such as the witch hazel stick or the spiritualistic medium, quite as much as by studying the position of wells in existence and calculating how oil belts probably ran. As the cost of a well was from three thousand to eight thousand dollars, according to its location, and as four thousand three hundred and seventy four of the five thousand five hundred and sixty wells drilled in the first ten years of the business eighteen fifty nine to eighteen sixty nine were dry holes or were abandoned as unprofitable something of the daring it took to operate on small means as most producers did in the beginning is evident but they loved the game and every man of them would stake his last dollar on the chance of striking oil with the extension of the field rapid strides had been made in tools, in rigs, in all of the various essentials of drilling a well. They had learned to use torpedoes to open up hard rocks, naphtha to cut the paraffin which coated the sand and stopped the flow of oil, seed bags to stop the inrush of a stream of water. They lost their tools less often and knew better how to fish for them when they did. In short, they had learned how to put down and care for oil wells. Equal advances had been made in other departments. Fewer cars were loaded with barrels. Tank cars for carrying in bulk had been invented. The wooden tank, holding two hundred to twelve hundred barrels, had been rapidly replaced by the great iron tank, holding twenty thousand or thirty thousand barrels. The pipelines had begun to go directly to the wells, instead of pumping from a general receiving station, or dump as it was called, thus saving the tedious and expensive operation of hauling. From beginning to end the business had been developed, systematized, simplified. Most important was the simplification of the transportation problem by the development of pipelines. By 1862 they were the one oil gatherer. Several companies were carrying on the pipeline business and two of them had acquired great power in the oil regions because of their connections with trunk lines. These were the Empire Transportation Company and the Pennsylvania Transportation Company. The former, which had been the first business organization to go into the pipeline business on a large scale, was a concern which appeared in the oil regions not over six months before Van Sickle began to pump oil. The Empire Transportation Company had been organized in 1865, to build up an east and west freight traffic via the Philadelphia and Erie Railroad, a new line which had just been leased by the Pennsylvania. Some ten railroads connected in one way or another with the Philadelphia and Erie, forming direct routes east and west. In spite of their evident community of interest, these various roads were kept apart by their jealous fears of one another. Each insisted on its own timetable, its own rates, its own way of doing things. The shipper via this route must make a separate bargain with each road and often submit to having his freight changed at terminals from one car to another because of the difference of gauge. The Empire Transportation Company undertook to act as a mediator between the roads and the shipper to make the route cheap, fast, and reliable. It proposed to solicit freight, furnish its own cars and terminal facilities, and collect money due. It did not make rates, however. It only harmonized those made by the various branches in the system. It was to receive a commission on the business secured, and a rental for the cars and other facilities it furnished. It was a difficult task the new company undertook, but it had at its head a remarkable man to cope with difficulties. This man, Joseph D. Potts, was in 1865 thirty-six years old. He had come of a long and honorable line of ironmasters of the Schuylkill region of Pennsylvania, but had left the great forge towns with which his ancestors had been associated, Pottstown, Glasgow Forge, Valley Forge, to become a civil engineer. His profession had led him to the service of the Pennsylvania Railroad, 
where he had held important positions in connection with which he now undertook the organization of the Empire Transportation Company. Colonel Potts, the title came from his service in the Civil War, possessed a clear and vigorous mind. He was far-seeing, forceful in execution, fair in his dealings. To marked ability and integrity he joined a gentle and courteous nature. The first freight which the Empire Transportation Company attacked after its organization was oil. The year was a great one for the oil regions, the year of Pithole. In January there had suddenly been struck on Pithole Creek in a wilderness six miles from the Allegheny River, a well located with a witch hazel twig which produced two hundred and fifty barrels a day, and oil was selling at eight dollars a barrel. Wells followed in rapid succession. In less than ten months the field was doing over ten thousand barrels a day. This sudden flood of oil caused a tremendous excitement. Crowds of speculators and investors rushed to pit hole from all over the country. The Civil War had just closed, soldiers were disbanding, and hundreds of them found their way to the new oil field. In six weeks after the first well was struck, pit hole was a town of six thousand inhabitants. In less than a year it had fifty hotels and boarding houses. Five of these hotels cost fifty thousand dollars or more each. In six months after the first well the post office of Pithole was receiving upwards of ten thousand letters per day and was counted third in size in the state, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Pithole being the order of rank. It had a daily paper, churches, all the appliances of a town. The handling of the great output of oil from the pithole field was a serious question. There seemed not enough cars in the country to carry it, and shippers resorted to every imaginable trick to get accommodations. When the agent of the Empire Transportation Company opened his office in June 1865 and demonstrated his ability to furnish cars regularly and in large numbers, trade rapidly flowed to him. Now the Empire Agency had hardly been established when the Van Sickle pipeline began to carry oil from Pithole to the railroad. Lines began to multiply. The railroad saw at once that they were destined speedily to do all the gathering and hasten to secure control of them. Colonel Potts's first pipeline purchase was a line running from Pithole to Titusville, which as yet had not been wet. When the Empire Transportation Company took over this line, nothing had been demonstrated but that oil could be driven by relay pumps five miles through a two-inch pipe. The Empire's first effort was to get a longer run by fewer pumps. The agent in charge, C. P. Hatch, believed that oil could be brought the entire ten and one-half miles from Pithole to Titusville by one pump. He met with ridicule, but he insisted on trying it in the new line his company had acquired. The experiment was entirely successful. Improvements followed as rapidly as hands could carry out the suggestions of ingenuity and energy. One of the most important made the first year of business was connecting wells by pipe directly with the tanks at the pumping stations, thus doing away with the expensive hauling in barrels to the dump. A new device for accounting to the producer for his oil was made necessary by this change and the practice of taking the gauge or measuring of the oil in the producer's tank before and after the run, and issuing duplicate run tickets was devised by Mr. Hatch. The producers, however, were not all square. It sometimes happened that they sold oil by a transfer order of the pipeline, which they did not have in the line. To prevent these, the Empire Transportation Company, in 1868, began to issue certificates for credit balances of oil. These soon became the general mediums of trade in oil, and remain so today. One of the cleverest of the pipeline devices of the Empire Company was its assessment for waste and fire. In running oil through pipes there is more or less loss by leaking and evaporation. In September 1868 Mr. Hatch announced that thereafter he would deduct two percent from oil runs for wastage. The assessment raised almost a riot in the region meetings were held, the Empire Transportation Company was denounced as a highway robber, and threats of violence were made if the order was enforced. While this excitement was in progress there came a big fire on the line. 
Now, the company's officials had been studying the question of fire insurance from the start. Fires in the oil regions were as regular a feature of the business as explosions used to be on the Mississippi steamboats, and no regular fire insurance company would take the risk. It had been decided that at the first fire there should be announced what was called a general average assessment, that is, a fire tax, and to be ready blanks were prepared. Now in the thick of the resistance to the wastage assessment came a fire, and the line announced that the producers having oil in the line must pay the insurance. The controversy at once waxed hotter than ever but was finally compromised by the withdrawal in this case of the fire insurance if the producers would consent to the tax for waste. They did consent, and later when fires occurred the general average assessment was applied without serious opposition. Both of these practices prevail today. By the end of 1871 the Empire Transportation Company was one of the most efficient and respected business organizations in the oil country. Its chief rival was the Pennsylvania Transportation Company, an organization which had its origin in the second pipeline laid in the oil regions. This line was built by Henry Harley, a man who for fully ten years was one of the most brilliant figures in the oil country. Harley was a civil engineer by profession, a graduate of the Troy Polytechnic Institute, and had held a responsible position for some time as an assistant of General Herman Hauck in the Hoosac Tunnel. He became interested in the oil business in 1862, first as a buyer of petroleum, then as an operator in West Virginia. In 1865 he laid a pipeline from one of the rich oil farms of the creek to the railroad. It was a success, and from this venture Harley and his partner, W. H. Abbott, one of the wealthiest and most active men in the country, developed an important transportation system. In 1868 J. Gould, who as president of the Erie Road was eager to increase his oil freight, bought a controlling interest in the Abbott and Harley lines, and made Harley general oil agent of the Erie system. Harley now became closely associated with Fisk and Gould, and the three carried on a series of bold and piratical speculations in oil which greatly enraged the oil country. They built a refinery near Jersey City, extended their pipeline system, and in 1871, when they reorganized under the name of the Pennsylvania Transportation Company, they controlled probably the greatest number of miles of pipe of any company in the region, and then were fighting the empire bitterly for freight. There is no part of this rapid development of the business more interesting than the commercial machine the oil men had devised in 1872 for marketing oil. A man with a thousand-barrel well in his hands in 1862 was in a plight. He had got to sell his oil at once for lack of storage room or let it run on the ground, and there was no exchange, no market, no telegraph, not even a post office within his reach where he could arrange a sale he had to depend on buyers who came to him. These buyers were the agents of the refineries in different cities or of the exporters of crude in New York. They went from well to well on horseback, if the roads were not too bad, on foot if they were, and at each place made a special bargain varying with the quantity bought and the difficulty in getting it away, for the buyer was the transporter, and as a rule furnished the barrels or boats in which he carried off his oil. It was not long before the speculative character of the oil trade, due to the great fluctuations in quantity, added a crowd of brokers to the regular buyers who tramped up and down the creek. When the railroads came in, the trains became the headquarters for both buyers and sellers. This was the more easily managed as the trains on the creek stopped at almost every oil farm. These trains became, in fact, a sort of traveling oil exchange, and on them a large percentage of all the bargaining of the business was done. The brokers and buyers first organized and established headquarters in Oil City in 1869, but there was an oil exchange in New York City as early as 1866. Titusville did not have an exchange until 1871. By this time the pipelines had begun to issue certificates for the oil they received and the trading was done to a degree in these. 
The method was simple and much more convenient than the old one. The producer ran his oil into a pipeline, and for it received a certificate showing that the line held so much to his credit. This certificate was transferred when the sale was made and presented when the oil was wanted. One achievement of which the oil men were particularly proud was increasing the refining capacity of the region. At the start the difficulty of getting the apparatus for a refinery to the creek had been so enormous that the bulk of the crude had been driven to the nearest manufacturing cities, Erie, Pittsburgh, and Cleveland. Much had gone to the seaboard, too, and Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore were all doing considerable refining. There was always a strong feeling in the oil regions that the refining should be done at home. Before the railroads came, the most heroic efforts were made again and again to get in the necessary machinery. Brought from Pittsburgh by water, as a rule, the apparatus had to be hauled from Oil City, where it had to be dumped on the muddy bank of the river, there were no wharfs, over the indescribable roads to the site chosen. It took weeks, months sometimes, to get in the apparatus. The chemicals used in the making of the oil, the barrels in which to store it, all had to be brought from outside. The wonder is that under these conditions anybody tried to refine on the creek. But refineries persisted in coming, and after the railroads came, increased. By 1872 the daily capacity had grown to nearly 10,000 barrels, and there were no more complete or profitable plants in existence than two or three of those on the creek. The only points having larger daily capacity were Cleveland and New York City. Several of the refineries had added barrel works. Assets were made on the ground. Iron works at Oil City in Titusville promised soon to supply the needs of both drillers and refiners. The exultation was great, and the press and people boasted that the day would soon come when they would refine for the world. There, in their own narrow valleys, should be made everything which petroleum would yield. Cleveland, Pittsburgh, the seaboard, must give up refining. The business belonged to the oil regions, and the oil men meant to take it. A significant development in the region was the tendency among many of the oil men to combine different branches of the business. Several large producers conducted shipping agencies for handling their own and other people's oil. The firm of Pearson Nahart was a prominent one carrying on this double business in the sixties and early seventies. J. J. Vandergriff, who has been mentioned already as one of the first men to take hold of the transportation problem, early became interested in production. As soon as the pipeline was demonstrated to be a success, he began building lines. He also added to his interest a large refinery, the Imperial of Oil City. Captain Vandergriff, by 1870, produced, transported, and refined his own oil, as well as transported and refined much of other people's. It was a common practice for a refinery in the oil regions to pipe oil directly to its works by its own line, and in 1872 one refinery in Titusville, the Octave, carried its refined oil a mile or more by pipe to the railroad. Although most of the refineries at this period sold their products to dealers and exporters, the building up of markets by direct contact with new territory was beginning to be a consideration with all large manufacturers. The Octave of Titusville, for instance, chartered a ship in 1872 to load with oil and send in charge of its own agent into South American ports. The odds against the oil men in developing the business had not been merely physical ones. There had been more than the wilderness to conquer, more than the possibilities of a new product to learn. Over all the early years of their struggle and hardships hovered the dark cloud of the Civil War. They were so cut off from men that they did not hear of the fall of Sumter for four days after it happened, and the news for the time blotted out interest even in flowing wells. Twice at least when Lee invaded Pennsylvania, the whole business came to a standstill, men abandoning the drill, the pump, the refinery to make ready to repel the invader. They were taxed for the war, taxes rising to ten dollars per barrel in 1865, one dollar on crude and twenty cents a gallon on refined, the oil barrel is usually estimated at forty-two gallons. 
they gave up their quota of men again and again at the call for recruits and when the end came and a million men were cast on the country this little corner of pennsylvania absorbed a larger portion of men probably than any other spot in the united states the soldier was given the first chance everywhere at work he was welcomed into oil companies stock being given him for the value of his war record there were lieutenants and captains and majors even generals scattered all over the field and the field felt itself honored and bragged as it did of all things of the number of privates and officers who immediately on disbanding had turned to it for employment it was not only the civil war from which the oil regions had suffered in eighteen seventy the franco-prussian war broke the foreign market to pieces and caused great loss to the whole industry and there had been other troubles from the first oil men had to contend with wild fluctuations in the price of oil in eighteen fifty nine it was twenty dollars a barrel and in eighteen sixty one it had averaged fifty-two cents. Two years later, in 1863, it averaged eight dollars and fifteen cents, and in 1867, but two dollars and forty cents. In all these first twelve years, nothing like a steady price could be depended on, for just as the supply seemed to have approached a fixed amount, a wildcat well would come in and knock the bottom out of the market such fluctuations were the natural element of the speculator and he came early buying in quantities and holding in storage tanks for higher prices if enough oil was held or if production fell off up went the price only to be knocked down by the throwing of great quantities of stocks on the market the producers themselves often held their oil though not always to their own profit a historic case of obstinate holding occurred in 1871 on the McCrae farm, the most productive field in the region at that time. Prices were hovering around $3, and McCrae swore he would not sell under $5. He bought, hired, and built iron tankage until he had upward of 200,000 barrels. There was great loss from leakage and from evaporations, and there were taxes but McCrae held on, refusing four dollars, four dollars and fifty cents, and even five dollars. Evil times came in the oil region soon after, and with them dollar oil. McCrae finally was obliged to sell his stocks at about a dollar twenty cents per barrel. To develop a business in face of such fluctuations and speculations in the raw product took not only courage, it took a dash of the gambler. It never could have been done, of course, had it not been for the streams of money which flowed unceasingly and apparently from choice into the regions. In 1865 Mr. Wright calculated that the oil country was using a capital of one hundred million dollars. In 1872 the oil men claimed the capital in operation was two hundred million dollars. It has been estimated that in the first decade of the industry nearly three hundred and fifty million dollars was put into it speculation in oil stock companies was another great evil it reached its height in eighteen sixty four and eighteen sixty five the flush times of the business stocks in companies whose holdings were hardly worth the stamps on a certificates were sold all over the land in march eighteen sixty five the aggregate capital of the oil companies whose charters were on file in Albany, New York, was $350 million, and in Philadelphia alone in 1864 and 1865, 1,000 oil companies, mostly bogus, are said to have been formed. These swindles were dignified by the names of officers of distinction in the United States Army, for the war was coming to an end, and the name of a general was the most popular and persuasive argument in the country. Of course, there came a collapse. The oil bubble burst in 1866, and it was nothing but the irrepressible energy of the region which kept the business going in the panic which followed. Then there was the disturbing effect of foreign competition. What would become of them if oil was found in quantities in other countries? A decided depression of the market occurred in 1866 when the government sent out reports of developments of foreign oil fields. If there was oil in Japan, China, Burma, Persia, Russia, Bavaria, 
in the quantities the government reports said, why, there was trouble in store for Pennsylvania, the oil men argued, and for a day the market fell. It was only for a day. Men forgot easily in the oil regions in the sixties. An evil in their business which they were only beginning to grasp fully in 1871 was the unholy system of freight discrimination which the railroads were practicing. Three trunk lines competed for the business by 1872. The Pennsylvania, which at least the Philadelphia and Erie, the Erie, and the Central. The latter road reached the oil regions by a branch from Ashtabula on the Lake Shore and Michigan Southern Division to Oil City. This branch was completed in 1868. The Pennsylvania claimed the oil traffic as a natural right for the oil regions were in Pennsylvania, and did not Tom Scott own that state? The Erie Road for about five years had been in the hands of those splendid pirates, Jay Gould and Jim Fisk. Naturally they took all they could get of the oil traffic, and took it by freebooting methods. Corners and rings were their favorite devices for securing trade, and more than once their aid had carried through daring and unscrupulous speculations in oil. The Central in this period was waging its famous desperate war on the Erie, Commodore Vanderbilt having marked that highway for his own along with most other things in New York State. All three of the roads began as early as 1868 to use secret rebates on the published freight rates in oil as a means of securing traffic. This practice had gone on until in 1871 any big producer, refiner, or buyer could bully a freight agent into a special rate those on the inside, those who had poles, also secured special rates. The result was that the open rate was enforced only on the innocent and the weak. Serious as all these problems were, there was no discouragement or shrinking from them. The oil men had rid themselves of bunco men and burst the oil bubbles. They had harnessed the brokers in exchanges and made strict rules to govern them. They had learned not to fear the foreigners, or to take with equal sang froid the dry hole which made them poor, or the gusher which made them rich. For every evil they had a remedy. They were not afraid even of the railroads, and loudly declared that if the discriminations were not stopped they would build a railroad of their own. Indeed the evils in the oil business in 1871, far from being a discouragement, rather added to the interest. They had never known anything but struggle, with conquest, and twelve years of it was far from cooling their ardor for a fair fight. More had been done in the oil regions in the first dozen years than the development of a new industry. From the first there had gone with the oil men's ambition to make oil to light the whole earth, a desire to bring civilization to the wilderness from which they were drawing wealth to create an orderly society from the mass of humanity which poured pell-mell into the region. A hatred of indecency first drew together the better element of each of the rough communities which sprang up. Whiskey sellers and women flocked to the region at the breaking out of the excitement. Their first shelters were shanties built on flatboats which were towed from place to place. They came to Rooseville, a collection of pine shanties and oil derricks built on a muddy flat as forlorn and disreputable a town in appearance as the earth ever saw. They tied up for trade, and the next morning woke up from their brawl to find themselves twenty miles away, floating down the Allegheny River. Rooseville meant to be decent. She had cut them loose, and by such summary vigilance she kept herself decent. Other towns adopted the same policy. By common consent, Vice was corralled largely in one town. Here a whole street was given up to dance houses and saloons, and those who must have a spree were expected to go to Petroleum Center to take it. Decency and schools. Vice cut adrift, they looked for a school teacher. Children were sadly out of place, but there they were, and these men, fighting for a chance, saw to it that a shanty with a school teacher in it was in every settlement. It was not long, too, before there was a church, a union church. To worship God was their primal instinct, to defend a creed, a later development. In the beginning every social contrivance was wanting. There were no policemen 
and each individual looked after evildoers. There were no firemen, and every man turned out with a bucket at a fire. There were no bankers, and each man had to put his wealth away as best he could until a peripatetic banker from Pittsburgh relieved him. At one time Dr. Egbert, a rich operator, is said to have had one million eight hundred thousand dollars in currency in his house. There were no hospitals, and in 1861, when the horrible possibilities of the oil fire were first demonstrated by the burning of the Rouse Well, a fire at which nineteen persons lost their lives, the many injured found welcome and care for long weeks in the little shanties of women already overburdened by the difficulties of caring for families in the rough community. Out of this poverty and disorder they had developed in ten years a social organization as good as their commercial. Titusville, the hamlet on whose outskirts Drake had drilled his well, was now a city of ten thousand inhabitants. It had an opera house, where in 1871 Clara Louise Kellogg and Christine Nilsson sang, Joe Jefferson and Janoshek played, and Wendell Phillips and Bishop Simpson spoke. It had two prosperous and fearless newspapers, its schools prepared for college. Oil City was not behind, and between them was a string of lively towns. Many of the oil farms had a decent community life. The Columbia Farm kept up a library and reading room for its employees. There was a good schoolhouse used on Sunday for services, and there was a Columbian farm band of no mean reputation in the oil regions. Indeed, by the opening of 1872, life in the oil regions had ceased to be a mere makeshift comforts in orderliness and decency even opportunities for education and for social life were within reach it was a conquest to be proud of quite as proud of as they were of the fact that their business had been developed until it had never before on the whole been in so satisfactory a condition nobody realized more fully what had been accomplished in the oil regions than the oil men themselves. Nobody rehearsed their achievements so loudly. In ten years, they were fond of saying, we have built this business up from nothing to a net product of six millions of barrels per annum. We have invented and devised all the apparatus, the appliances, the forms needed for a new industry. We use a capital of two hundred million and support a population of sixty thousand people. To keep up our supply, we drill one hundred new wells per month at an average cost of six thousand dollars each. We are fourth in the exports of the United States. We have developed a foreign market, including every civilized country on the globe. But what had been done was, in their judgment, only a beginning. Life ran swift and ruddy and joyous in these men. They were still young, most of them under forty and they looked forward with all the eagerness of the young who have just learned their powers to years of struggle and development. They would solve all these perplexing problems of overproduction, of railroad discrimination, of speculation. They would meet all their own needs. They would bring the oil refining to the region where it belonged. They would make their towns the most beautiful in the world. There was nothing too good for them, nothing they did not hope and dare. But suddenly, at the very heyday of this confidence, a big hand reached out from nobody knew where to steal their conquest and throttle their future. The suddenness and the blackness of the assault on their business stirred to the bottom their manhood and their sense of fair play, and the whole region arose in a revolt which is scarcely paralleled in the commercial history of the United States. End of chapter 1. Recording by Tom Weiss. Tom's audiobooks dot com